Welcome to Mrs. AB Literature um, YouTube tutorial on um, planning a streetcar name desire essay. Um, before we start, I um, just want to take you through a couple of things. Um, you work through the tutorial on YouTube, take notes as you're uh, watching. Um, there are activities that you'll be asked to do, so at that point you can just pause the tutorial until you've finished and then restart when you're ready to go again. Um, the documents to download for this lesson are on Teams under the Files menu. It's the Example Responses booklet. It, it's about 80 pages long, so uh, you just need the Streetcar Name Desire essay which starts on page 75. Okay, so let's start. So our objective uh, in this lesson is to model a little bit, to plan and write parts of an answer based on scene 8 of A Streetcar Named Desire uh, for the Language and Literature Specification Paper 2 um, for the A-level. We are going to be working uh, with an exemplar and that exemplar, hopefully you should have that downloaded and ready to refer to. OK, uh, before we start, um, what I'd like you to do is to think about the assessment objectives. So please um, think about AO1, AO2 and AO3, specifically for this essay. What do you think the examiners will be looking for? Um, before you start, please note the mark allocation. So the AO2 is the more dominant criteria, um, AO1 15 marks and AO3 10 marks. So um, at this point, just pause the tutorial um, and make some notes regarding what you think these AOs would involve in this essay. OK, so I'm hoping that you have included some of these things. Obviously, I haven't shown you the essay question yet. We'll look at that in more detail um, and that will hopefully give you a chance to think about how to answer for AO2, which one of the main things you'll see there um, is this idea of um, answering the question just here. OK, so AO1, as you know, is the language levels. This is the, the dominant level. This is the thing that we look at as an examiner um, or to just um, look, look at whether you are covering those language levels from Lexis, semantics, grammar, phonology, etc, etc. Uh, terminology is important, but um, please don't feel that you, you need to just feature spot. We are after more meaningful analysis of the language, which is why the language levels tends to be the, the higher, the one we look at first. Um, please look at detailed explanations, quotations, and then some of these elements here of spoken language which come into play for this question. So your non-fluency features, your pauses, your interruptions, uh, any sort of non-verbal communication, um, any spoken language theory you might have come across, um, power theory, gender theory, uh, pragmatics theories, so anything to do with things like politeness or um, speech act theory. Um, OK, for AO2, uh, we, you need to make sure you put DP in, that's different parts of the, um, the play in this case. Um, without that, you're unlikely to get above the level 2 for this particular element. Um, depending on the question, you will be, may be asked to look at a particular theme, um, and usually that's linked to sort of characters and character developments. One thing to remember is that this whole um, exam paper is entitled Exploring Conflict. So again, make sure that um, as you, you start working with that exam question, you are thinking in terms of what conflicts and what frictions appear uh, in the extract and elsewhere in the play. Um, the key, there are two elements really to key elements to the AO2 and the first one is how the writer constructs the characters identities so we're looking specifically at the language choices in this case Tennessee Williams uses to um, convey a particular character uh, and that does again include those sort of spoken language features um, interpretation is heavily weighted so please make sure that you're answering the question 
and that you're interpreting the messages that come out of those language um, methods that the writer uses. Um, AO3, uh, unlike the um, Handmaid's Tale, the section B of paper one, AO3 is the least dominant criteria. However, it is still 10 marks. Uh, so you need to make sure you are covering two elements. The genre conventions here, which includes elements, for example, of the theatre form and genre, you know, discussing whether this is realism or expressionism or a mixture of both. Remembering that Tennessee Williams' own version of, of the, um, the genre is this idea of plastic theatre, uh, linking other genres as well, for example, tragedy. Um, or a psychological drama. And then at the bottom, some of those contextual features here, including, you can see at the bottom here, any critical readings that you have done um, in the course of your time studying. Uh, some of these you will have um, had from the English and Media Centre magazine, um, but also from other um, sort of critical perspectives. Uh, please, on the context, make sure that you are not just bolting that on and writing a history essay. So it should only be there if you are interpreting or using it to help you with an interpretation. OK, let's move on. So um, just to recap now on the um, how the AOs work in terms of the keywords. So on this slide, I've put the keywords in red and you can see how each level steps up. So AO1, 2 and 3 on level 3 tends to use words such as straightforward or some and perhaps the key word here is explains. So it's perhaps lacking a little bit of exploration but it's relevant and it's a straightforward approach. Uh, level four, they're looking for a little bit more, so um, the start of some more pu purposeful analysis in terms of the language levels, um, some secure analysis, so more developed. Um, and again, you've got this idea of a clear response. Um, and um, although I haven't highlighted it here, the idea here of ex exploration here as opposed to explaining. So the difference between those two elements um, is quite clear. It's not just about sort of setting out your ideas. It's, it's doing a little bit more evaluation than that. And then finally for level five, um, think purposeful, think patterns, but it's sustained. So all the way through. So we, we need to see that really quite tight analysis of um, the language levels. Uh, you'll see here, instead of just coherent um, in terms of terminology, we're actually looking at a range here. And this keyword comes up, um, which is sophisticated ideas. I guess the, the word that I use most, um, most often for that level five is this word perceptive. Uh, and also we've got the idea here, instead of just exploring, we are assessing the value of elements like genre to um, interpret uh, interpreting messages and meanings. Uh, perceptive here, um, yeah, the only way I can describe this is really, really well thought through um, and insightful. So you're actually making a, in, a jump with inference that perhaps examiners and so on won't have actually thought of. OK, so our exam question is um, this today. Um, I'll just read it out for you. And then if you would like to pause the, um, the, the tutorial here, you can make a note of it. So refer to scene eight, beginning suddenly, Stanley tell us a joke um, and ending. You want me to clear your places. Stella begins to cry weakly. Um, this interaction occurs at the beginning of the scene. It is Blanche's birthday. Mitch has not arrived and Stanley and Stella have been arguing about Blanche. Referring to these lines and other parts of the play, explore how and why Williams presents characters contrasting values at different points in the play. Uh, quite a nice question actually in terms of values. There's so much you can bring in there. Um, so I'll just let you obviously just pause the tutorial at this point. What I'd like you to do is make a note of that exam question. 
um, and also can you please do step one of our uh, steps to planning so this is read the question and highlight and annotate the keywords okay welcome back um, this we now move straight on to step two um, you're given an extract in the exam um, you should be able to um, work with it quite easily because when we look at the exam question it does give you an indication of where in the scene this occurs this actually just occurs a few lines down from the, the, the beginning of the scene um, and the question also gives you some of the background so we know it's Blanche's birthday we know Mitch has not arrived and we know that Stella and Stanley I have been arguing about Blanche so we've already got that sense of conflict appearing um, within the question it, it it does kind of highlight that for us again remembering that the the whole exam paper is called exploring conflict um, the key words in this are obviously referring to these lines that's the extract it clearly tells you you've got to refer to other parts of the play and it then asks you to explore how and why now the why here is really a, just as important as the how so the how is the language methods the methods the encoding of that text that Williams uses and the why here is um, is where um, you are looking at the messages that are involved um, and then the, the key sort of um, words here, the, the question steer, is um, contrasting values. And again, just in case you hadn't got it the first time, it is telling you to look at different points in the play. Um, so with the focus that we're looking at here is the contrasting values of um, the key characters who are also mentioned in this question. OK, um, it's time now just to have a read of that extract. What I'd like you to do is have a piece of notepaper handy and then make some notes based on the key quotations or anything that you noticed that linked to the question within that extract. OK, so um, I've taken this directly from the examiner's report for this exam paper, which is, um, I think it's the 2017 exam paper. Um, and um, there are a number, you can see how much the examiners have picked out here. Um, this is only a indicative content, so obviously the examiners will be um, marking and crediting anything that isn't in here, but this is just a sort of an indication to um, anybody's examining to, um, to look out for some of these things. Um, but they have picked out quite a lot. Um, so um, I'll, again I'll just let you have a read of the, some of the things that the examiners have um, suggested you could talk about and um, give you a chance to uh, make some notes on that. Um, once you've done that, uh, again pause the tutorial to do this, um, use the essay question, think about those, those command words and the question steer here and can you link any AO3 content or context, sorry, to the um, uh, to what you've got here or what you've already listed in your own notes? Again, pause the tutorial and um, continue it when you're ready. All right, we're now on to step three. So step three is about you've you've done done what you needed to on the extract. Um, hopefully that's fine. You've got plenty to say about that. Um, step three now is to pick up on different parts of the play. So which extracts or which elements of the play do you think fit really well with what you've picked out from uh, the extract so far? Uh, so once again, just pause the tutorial at this point um, and restart. Once you've picked the different parts of the play, that you would like to include. Um, try to um, just add to your notes at this point. So anything that you've got on the extract, what can you link uh, in your own notes on the different parts? 
Okay, again, I'll, uh, you can resume as soon as you're ready. Uh, once again, I've got this from the examiner's report. Um, they've actually picked loads and, you know, it does show that actually you can pick whatever you want and as long as you're applying it to the question and it's valid as a choice, examiners can't actually mark you down for it. So there is always a note in the mark schemes to suggest that examiners must be prepared to credit other valid choices. Um, but you can see what they've got here. They have focused, though, on the different values. So we've got the different values of class and background in scene two and scene three and scene four. Um, looking at how sort of Blanche reacts to the, the, the um, environment around her. Uh, you could also look at scene one as well um, for that. Uh, you could then look at, so that's class, you could look at men and women's different values. Um, my favourite scene there, scene three, with the gambling scene. Um, my whole theory there, obviously, about the survival of the fittest, um, that this is actually a, what, some kind of wildlife documentary we're watching at this point, um, where it's about pack mentality. But wonderful example there of masculinity and femininity in scene three. Um, but of course, again, in that scene 11, that scene where Blanche is eventually taken away um, and looking at how, um, you know, Tennessee Williams is dealing with the, the theme of mental health and the theme of um, sort of dominance over people who are seen as less powerful than others. Um, you've also got other values. So um, the examiners here have picked out the romantic values. So, for example, um, it's the, the irony between Stella's sexual desire for Stanley. Um, Blanche actually desires stability and security. That's what she wants. She wants marriage. But actually, she plays at sex to get marriage. She plays at sex to, um, uh, to find affection, I suppose, and love. Um, so there's some interesting conflicts going on between sort of the... the sort of sexual politics in the play. Um, Stella and Stanley's values at different points in the play. Um, so, for example, Stella wants to protect Blanche. You see that in this scene uh, where Stella actually sticks up for Blanche um, and gets an earful from Stanley as a result. Um, but also this idea that Stanley has a very particular view of his own marital life. Um, maybe sort of looking back again at this idea of masculinity and male and f female roles here. Um, but it, Blanche doesn't doesn't figure in, in his plan. Um, so obviously looking at how she upsets that kind of apple cart and he's unable to um, sort of play out his own values and his own ideologies about domestic life. Um, family values, just looking at the difference between the Dubois family and the um, and uh, Stella's new family, and then the different values and backgrounds and compat compatibility between Mitch and, and Blanche. So there's some really really interesting scenes. There's food for thought, um, and actually it really doesn't matter which exam question you get. There are so many. Uh, extracts that you're able to look at and um, apply to any scene try it have a go pick out a scene and say what extracts can what theme is here and what extracts what other extracts link to it uh, you'll see that there's lots of examples okay so I'm going to move on now I don't hopefully you won't need to pause that but if you do need to then uh, feel free um, and we're going to start to look now at um, getting into that exam question a little bit more so we've just done step three, which is collecting together any DP, different parts, any extracts we want to use. We're now on to step four. I think it's important at this stage to go back to the question and to think about those, um, those command words and that question steer. Just to remind ourselves that we are actually looking at characters contrasting values in this question. Um, so it is really important to make sure that as you now start building your introduction, which is what this is, and your argument, that you are thinking about contrasting values to be central to your argument. Now, I've, I've had to have a fiddle about with this. You know I like the, um, the sliding scale, the continuum scale here. Um, in this case, 
you need to think about what your argument is. And what I've decided to focus this on with the continuum scale is um, the contrasting values, the new and the old traditions. Um, Blanche obviously representing the old and Stanley representing the new. Um, so what I've done is I've colour coded it and kind of squished the, um, the, the characters on here, although probably I should have put Stanley over this side somewhere. Um, but Blanche, and then I've got, um, because it's conflict, I thought I'd choose a little lightning bolt. I, I put them on the, the characters actually on the sliding scale. So uh, my argument, I guess, is, is that Blanche represents old values, represents tradition, represents something that's outdated and that doesn't fit with the, the new kind of New Orleans culture um, that she finds herself in when she ends up at Elysian Heights. Um, Elysian Field, sorry. Um, Stanley um, is up this end, right up to the new. He's the, you know, em embodies the American dream, somebody who is a second generation immigrant, the son of an immigrant, and um, considers himself a new American, somebody who embraces the whole idea that um, Americans can live free and um, can profit as long as they give into, give back into society. Um, so he works hard. He works hard, he plays hard. He enjoys what he gets out of it. And that's his freedom, which is obviously embodying that American dream. So right up, I've placed him right up this end on the new. Now, actually, for my argument, you'll see this in a moment when you, because I've, I've got an example of my, of an introduction I might use, is I think the antithesis here comes actually with Stella. What tips the balance between old and new? Why is it that Blanche actually can't fit in to New Orleans, can't fit into this culture? Well, yes, you could argue it's Stanley because he is forcing the old out. He, he, he disregards the old traditions. But actually, what we have here is Stella. Now, Stella tips the balance. So if, what I could have done is put like a little... Um, I don't know, like a seesaw in the middle here and um, placed, if you'd have done that and placed Stella and Stanley on one side, it's Stella that tips the balance towards the new uh, and she's significant because she comes from old stock, she comes from the deep south, she comes from the same background as Blanche but she's rejected it and she's rejected it because she understands that in order to survive in uh, mid 20th century America with a changing um, culture, changing values, post-war, um, she needs to fit in, she needs to adapt and change. And it's Blanche here that suffers because she's not willing to make those changes and she harks after that old style. So it's kind of my argument here. Now, what I'd like you to do, obviously, it doesn't fit quite so well on uh, this question doesn't on the continuum, but I've tried to make it work. What I'd like you to do is have a look at that question now yourself and think, well, what's your argument? How are you going to place your characters within this idea of contrasting values? And how are you going to build a thesis? A thesis is a statement about contrasting values and an antithesis which is a you know kind of a challenge to that argument okay again just uh, pause the tutorial at this point and feel free to take some time to have a think about that all right I'm thinking now you may have made some notes if you haven't do so now on how you have organized your sliding scale I want you to write out, think about what your argument is, because this is going to become your introduction. Um, so an introduction, I think, should include three things. A thesis, which is an observation about the question focus. So in this case, it will be an observation here about the contrasting values of the different characters and the friction that occurs between them. An antithesis, some form of challenge or going beyond that question focus. And then finally, some kind of message. Uh, so what is the 
the author's main message because of this what's the author's main message surrounding oh wrong way surrounding the contrasting values of um, the characters so just take a moment to um, do that again pause the tutorial if you need to uh, think about how your your introduction your argument will be structured as soon as you've done that then uh, feel free uh, to continue and we'll look at what I have done. So I've modelled that example that looks a bit like this. So I'm just going to read it to you um, and see what you think. So this is my introduction. OK, I've just gone all out for it. I don't know what you think to it, but, uh, you know, hopefully it's not too bad. Uh, Tennessee Williams presents his audiences with a conflict at the boundaries between old and new culture where the values of both cannot meet. Blanche is a symbol of the old romantic southern bell culture, clinging on to a dying way of life, a legacy of the old plantations in the south thriving on the slave trade. However, Williams shows that in the mid-20th century this way of li life is fading. He presents the play as a survival of the fittest, where modern values are presented as more powerful and enduring than, than the old, oh, old symbolised by Stanley. Blanche is a true tragic heroine within an alien culture and is doomed to die out as a result. Further evidence of this is Stella, who, through from a traditional culture, though from a traditional culture, favours the new. Williams may be celebrating the rise of the new, but he could also be seen to be lamenting the loss of the romantic Deep South and a set of cultural values that does more than just victimise the lower classes. He presents a clear pathos towards Blanche, a reminiscence for times past. So as you can see from here, I've kind of embedded um, the thesis, which is the idea of the survival of the fittest, in with a message. Uh, the message here being, you know, sh I guess it's sort of a question, should we be lamenting that dying out of an old culture? Um, and the message is actually seen through my antithesis, which is in these last three lines here, which suggests actually Williams's message could be about celebrating the new, but it could also be about nostalgia, about looking back at the past as well, and what um, American culture perhaps misses as that dies out. Um, something like that, anyway, would probably work. Um, so that as an example of an introduction is that's Mrs. Brown doing an introduction. Um, on the next slide, I'm going to show you a student introduction. And this is the one that's from your booklet. So you will have that um, in front of you, that exemplar booklet. Remember, this starts on page 75. So this is the student's introduction. You can see there I've just put the um, what the student's writing looks like so you can hopefully find it better in your booklet. Um, and again, I'm going to read out um, the student answer. I'm kind of hoping you'll think mine's better, but who knows, hopefully. Um, Throughout the entirety of A Streetcar Named Desire, there is an ongoing conflict between characters. Much of this is due to the contrasting values which can be seen at different points in the play. The extract in particular is a moment of high tensions and clearly demonstrates the contrasting values. It is Blanche's birthday. Stella desperately tries to make it good, sorry that should say, for delicate Blanche. However, Stanley's aggression and Mitch's absence makes it an impossible task. Okay, so... Um, just make some notes on that in light of what I've just talked to you about in terms of I'm just going to flick back in terms of that sort of basis of the introduction with a clear argument maybe some form of antithesis and a message um, have a think about what the student is or isn't doing um, I'm hoping you'll think mine's better um, so again I'll just give you a couple of minutes to do that uh, pause the tutorial to make some notes um, and then I'll give you some commentary afterwards. OK, so um, this e extract, where it talks about this extract, is actually um, really just coming from 
the exam question. So the, this is, it's okay, but it is just really a repetition of the exam question. There isn't a lot of interpretation there. I haven't really thought closely about some of those sort of thematic elements. Um, again, this is repeated. It's Blanche, Blanche's birthday. That's from the question as well. Um, the student tries to, does sort of focus a little bit more when talking about a moment of high tension and also this idea of Stella desperately trying to make it good uh, for Blanche. So um, there, there, there's some interpretation but probably not a huge amount so I'm hoping that you're able to pick that out. Uh, now what I'd like you to do is to spend some time yourself thinking about your notes and building your own introduction. So once again, um, pause the tutorial and restart it when you're ready to continue. Okay, I'm just going to do a quick recap. So the structure of answering this question. In an exam, this shouldn't take you too long. Um, but do remember, you have two and a half hours for this exam paper. Um, this is 45 marks. Uh, section A is 55 marks. Um, so you're looking at, I would say, around about an hour and 10 minutes for this question and an hour and 20 minutes for um, your section A. Um, that means that you do have time to plan. You do have time to read and you do have time to take notes on the extracts and any DP, different parts that you want to include. And my biggest advice here is that you actually do take that time. If it takes you 15 minutes to plan, you've got, you know, nearly an hour to write it and maybe a few, a couple of minutes just to read through and check your notes. Um, it's not, you know, you can get a lot written in just under an hour. So don't rush it and don't panic. Just spend the time planning and making notes so that you're ready to write and when you are ready to write you can write in an informed way. Okay that's sorry that was a bit of a Mrs Brown lecture sorry about that. All right so step five nice and easy there you can then look at your notes number your points and write them up. Uh, just a little uh, reminder there that you do need to include all those AOs and all those elements to the AOs that we covered earlier on in this lesson and don't forget your DP as well. Okay, finally, uh, I'm nearly nearly done. Um, suggested essay structure, I don't know. I mean, to be fair, you can, you can plan it yourself, I would think. And there's no right or wrong way of writing this. Um, this structure strip, if you call it that, um, is just a way of trying to make sure that you do include some of those key elements from the assessment objectives. It's a bit clunky. Um, so, but it, it, it might, it probably does work. So you've got extract where you're looking at some analysis of, you know, the language features there. You are analysing a point. Uh, you've got to use your context. Please, for AO2, remember the dominant criteria there that you are adding interpretation. Um, and um, then you intersperse your DP in between. You don't have to do it like that. A lot of examples, you, examples you'll see will actually just pop the DP at the end. We'll deal with the extract first and then the DP. What I like about doing it this way is that you will be able to see a little bit more clearly any character or thematic development where if you have associated linked points between the extract and the DP you'll see that development a lot clearer than you would if you put the DP at the end of your essay. So just bear that in mind. Um, paragraph three here, genre and theatre context. Um, again, it, it's um, it's AO3, a bit clunky, but if you think you're going to forget it, maybe use a paragraph and lead a paragraph with a topic opener about genre, um, you know, sort of realism, plastic theatre, the fact that this is in the theatre, that it's a visual medium as well as a, um, a an hour or a spoken medium. Um, and that you obviously can access it from the book as well. Um, but referring to audience responses, um, again, looking at then and now. So, you know, what would a 1947 audience interpret differently maybe to what we do 
especially as we're now in a post feminism age um you know we may look at sort of gender politics a, a little bit differently to a contemporary an audience contemporary with tennessee williams um here you can see paragraph four i've explicitly put in that you need to be looking at mode here you can't get away with without looking at spoken language features in this in this essay to make sure that that is an element and again you've got your linked dp different parts on mode as well again doing it this way you're interspersing the two or interleaving the two here showing that you can you you'll see hopefully a development uh, in the way that characters speak in your extract and then how they might speak elsewhere in the play Obviously, this scene is based on scene eight, so do look before and do look after, um, so that there you've got a sense of understanding of how characters um, develop across the play. And then finally, if you if you ha get time, is just go back again to that extract. Maybe an additional point there that you could look at again with your extract. Um, I don't I, I don't think there's any hard and fast rule about a percentage of DP and and extract. Um, usually I suggest that you look at um, maybe 50-50 or possibly um, a 60% extract and 40% DP. Um, but I don't think in this specification, I don't think they mark you down if, it, if it's really, you know, if it's, it's unequal. Um, but do be aware that you do need to include that DP. Okay. Um, Finally, then, I've given you, again, you've got this in your pack, uh, this student paragraph. Um, so this is it's towards the beginning of their essay. It's not right at the beginning. Um, so I'm going to read it out to you. As I'm reading, can you make a note of what they've done well and two things you would suggest them to, to help them improve? By this point in the play, Stanley has no respect for Blanche and no interest in consoling her. As the son of a Polish immigrant, Stanley is lower class, a binary opposition to Blanche, who is of high class and is well educated. That should say one, sorry. One key value of Stanley's is his desire for equality in the, in the new America. In this extract, the line, I don't know how, I don't know any refined enough for your taste, when Blanche asks for a funny story, employs sarcasm. The use of the adjective refined is upwards divergence to add impact to the line. The phrase implies that Blanche is snobby and he has no interest in attempting to please her. This highlights his strong values surrounding his class and equality. Stanley continues to demonstrate his uninterest in Blanche after she tells begins to tell her story. Rather than fillers such as laughter, he instead uses her, a very basic vocalisation which implies he does not understand or is not impressed. This desperation from Stanley can be seen through the rest of the play where he constantly corrects Blanche on being called a Polak. He insists he is 100% American. Okay, so again, just take a couple of minutes, pause the tutorial uh, to think about what they've done well. It's, it's not awful. Um, uh, but also think about two things that you would suggest um, to them to help them improve and then once you've done that um, you can move on all right finally um, the examiners gave this student um, pretty solid level three um, so it's if you think back to our key words from the criteria um, we are looking at some, some clear, some analysis, some consideration. Um, that key word, if you remember from the criteria, was they are explaining, they're not really evaluating. Um, they are using some language levels, but they're not really doing it in a purposeful way and they're not really selecting patterns. Um, again, one way of getting patterns is to interleave that DP into the um, into the extract analysis. You'll find the patterns much easier, much more easily if you do that. I think. Um, 
AO2 sum analysis. Um, it's a straightforward focus on the question, which is fine. Um, and showing that they are, have looked at some of the crafting that Tennessee Williams uses. And then finally, AO3 there, they've, they've said some consideration of genre. You'll see that through the, the um, essay. Um, they've been given a low level three. Um, there does seem to be enough comment, although the examiner hasn't written this, there does seem to be enough comment on context to hit that level three. Um, I think they would struggle to get a level three if they didn't write anything at all on context. You do need to include the both. And AO2 there, you can see there is enough DP, although if you look at the essay, um, it does look like they forgot it and then added it in later. Um, but there is just enough DP to move beyond that level two for AO2. So it's not a, it's not brilliant, but it's not a disaster. Um, so getting a sort of a mid band. Um, finally, um, it's now you time for you to um, do some work on this. I'm not asking you to do a whole essay. Um, I think at this stage, maybe complete one or maybe two paragraphs. You could perhaps do a one par paragraph plus a DP. Um, on one of the points that you've picked out from the um, extract and in your own planning, what I'd like you to do is to write that paragraph, um, stop at that point, read your introduction and your paragraph and think to yourself, if you were to continue this and finish the essay, what level would you be on? Um, and then finally, give yourself a star and importantly a wish, a target for improvement. Um, once you've done that, um, if you could um, just try and communicate that to me, obviously we're all on lockdown at the moment, so via email, um, or if you want to put it on Teams, I would suggest probably putting it onto email, um, just so that I, I'm aware of what you've done. Um, if you wanted to add that paragraph as well, then I can have a look at the paragraph too. Okay, well, I uh, wish you best of luck with that. Thank you for listening. I'm sorry I was a bit waffly at times, but hopefully that was reasonably clear. Um, thank you. Um, finally, I'm just going to leave that on so that you've got that as a um, reference as you mark your own. So perhaps take a screen print of that. Okay, thank you very much.